Hi everyone. In this talk, we'll speak very briefly about how quantum computing is done in the real world. What is some of the hardware that is out there for us and how selection of one quantum processing unit or QPU over another affects us. We think about quantum information and that is device independent. The qubit and the quantum gate are abstract mathematical objects that have many ways to implement in the physical world. The physical implementation in reality is quantum hardware. This concept is exactly the same in classical computers. Today, all of us are familiar with the silicon-based transistor computers. However, historically, there were other types of computers, such as vacuum tube computers and even mechanical computers. Even today, computers may differ in the exact architecture in which transistors connect and speak to each other. But thankfully, this is all hidden or abstracted away from us. In this video, we will describe how quantum hardware considerations become important when designing high-level quantum algorithms. In classical logic, it's possible to make any logic circuit using just a single gate, the NOT AND gate. This is called a universal gate set, though it's a set of just one element. It's also possible to make a universal gate set with another gate, like uh, the exclusive OR, for example. Deciding on a gate set depends on which gate the hardware designer is happier building because it may be cheaper or simpler in their specific case. In quantum computation, there are many possible universal gate sets that must include at least one single qubit gate and one two qubit gate. The selection of gates depends on which operations are possible on the hardware of your choice. It depends critically on implementation and can even change for different designs within the same technology. Another constraint introduced by the hardware implementation is the selection of qubits, which can directly undergo two qubit gates. Some technologies require two qubits to be physically connected or adjacent in order to undergo a two qubit gate. This is typically the case in superconducting qubits. In others, it's not required. For example, trapped ion quantum processors have a long range coupling that doesn't require them to be directly next to each other. In neutral atom computers and elsewhere, there is even the ability to change the connectivity during the runtime of the algorithm. But that's already going beyond the scope of this video. In general, the lower the connectivity between qubits, the more swap gates are required to be added to the circuit to perform its function. This increases both the circuit depth and the amount of two qubit gates needed. Because each operation introduces noise to the circuit, until we have a fault-tolerant quantum computer at least, this has the effect of making the circuit perform more poorly. Synthesis involves taking the high-level description and making concrete circuit implementation based on the above-mentioned constraints. There are many competing technologies in the current world of quantum processing units. There's neutral atoms, silicon qubits, superconducting qubits, trapped ions, NV centers, to name just a few. It's the zoo of qubits, which is an expression I don't like, but I am willing to use it because I do believe some of them are cute but useless, some are scary and may bite you, and it's very likely most of them will be extinct soon. So some QPUs are ahead in the race, others show future promise, and as is the case in classical silicon computers, maybe only one will stay with us in the future. The cloud-connected hardware currently available via the classic platform includes ions and superconducting qubits. Trapped ions are built from atoms in a vacuum chamber, which had one or more electrons stripped from them. This makes it possible to trap them by using electromagnetic forces. These forces are very strong, so trapped ions can remain trapped in the vacuum chamber for very long times, measured in days or more. Ions are typically placed in a row, one next to each other, like a string of pearls. Each can be manipulated using lasers, exciting a specific ion to a specific quantum state. That's the gist of the single qubit operation. Two qubit operations are also done with lasers and happen via a mechanism called the molnar solenson gate. They depend on the relative quantum states of two ions in the chain. Amazingly, the ions in this two qubit operations don't have to be next to each other. As we mentioned before, ions are more well connected than superconducting qubits. In superconducting quantum computing, the qubits are implemented by building electrical circuits that have special elements in them that are built from superconducting materials. These elements, called Josephson junctions, are the key to building a device whose quantum states are suitable to building qubits. So there are distinct and controllable two states that we can put that system in by using, in this case, microwave radiation. 
There's a lot more to be said on superconducting qubits, which are currently a workhorse of the quantum industry, but we won't go into more detail now. One thing we can say is that typically, as of today, the number of qubits available via quantum clouds is larger for superconducting qubits than those of trapped ions. Thinking about the circuits we get due to the different ways a circuit is synthesized for different hardware targets, we probably will get different circuits. How do we reason about the results and decide what to run and how to tweak what we got? Circuit depth is the number of gates performed on a qubit involved in the circuit. Because gates are not perfect, each gate operation introduces errors. Some coherent and some incoherent, which we call noise. Two qubit gates are typically much more difficult to perform and therefore introduce more noise than one qubit gates. When looking at the results of circuit synthesis, we can look at depth, we can look at the number of C0 gates or other two qubit gates and compare what we get from different hardware targets. The classic IDE gives us this information very clearly and allows us to make comparisons. There's also cost considerations. In many providers, the cost depends on the number of gates where the price is different for one and two qubit gates. In other, the price relates to the total time taken to the circuit to run. And this depends again on the number of gates. In general, the execution price of the same circuit may change dramatically between different providers. We briefly explain how hardware considerations influence circuit synthesis via native gate set, connectivity, and price considerations. The classic platform takes into account these factors and more to make your quantum algorithm design amazingly simple and fun. Hi, welcome back. After we've learned about the constraints hardware imposes on resulting quantum circuits, we can dive into a concrete example of synthesizing under constraints using the classic platform. The hardware's most apparent restriction is the limitation on the number of qubits. However, we can show that such a simple constraint can still significantly change the gate level implementation. In the next few minutes, we will provide such an example. First, let's remind ourselves of auxiliary qubits in quantum computation. These qubits serve as temporary storage. For example, here is a V-chain implementation of a four-controlled RY gate with an auxiliary qubit. Under the requirements that the auxiliary qubit is at the zero state, it stores the AND operation on the first four control qubits, Q0 to Q3, and the operation result is then passed to toggle the RY gate. Afterwards, the auxiliary qubit is uncomputed to be reused in other computations. Some functions, like multi-controlled operations with many control qubits, can have different implementations, which differ by the number of auxiliary qubits used. The classic built-in function library has a multitude of such functions. A trade-off exists between the number of auxiliary qubits used to construct the gate versus its depth and CX gate count. Let's synthesize a circuit with a single MCX gate of 10 control qubits. The total number of functional qubits is 11. In addition, let's optimize the CX gate count. The CX gate count, or another Clifford 2 qubit gate, such as CZ, is a good proxy for computation time and algorithm success rate in the NISC era. And it is independent of the individual single qubit gates used to form a universal gate set. Here, we use CX and U as basis gates. First, we synthesize without any width limitation. We now observe that the resulting circuit uses 20 qubits, the 11 functional ones, and nine auxiliaries. As expected, the synthesis engine chooses an implementation that uses more auxiliary qubits to reduce the CX gate count. Now, let's limit the width to 11 qubits. As a result, the synthesis engine chooses an auxiliary-less implementation. As expected, the CX gate count is higher due to the additional hardware restrictions. Let's discuss a more advanced example of hardware-aware synthesis that considers the limited qubit connectivity in superconducting architectures. Before that, let's take a step back and consider the physical limitations imposed on classical computation. In a world without memory limitations, every classical computation done once could be stored forever in memory and queried upon request. A technique commonly referred to as dynamic programming utilizes that to reduce computational complexity. We store the intermediate calculation results to avoid repeating them multiple times. 
but for large enough cases, this ideal picture breaks down. The place on the on-chip memory, or cache, runs out, and the operating system instead routes new intermediate results to the random access memory, or RAM. Practically, the communication between the CPU and the RAM is orders of magnitude slower than the communication between the CPU and the cache. So we expect the storage operations to exhibit a diminishing return behavior at some point. Then we prefer to repeat calculations instead of storing them due to communication overheads, a choice some might find counterintuitive. Back to the quantum world. The computational architectures are still premature compared to their classical counterparts. Particularly, quantum memory models in the NISC era are like that. Surprisingly, we can still find examples of the quantum analog of such behavior. First, let's ask Classic Synthesis Engine to construct a 50 control qubit MCX gate and optimize the circuit on the CX gate count. We assume a fully connected qubit diagram, so there are no restrictions on the entangling gates. The resulting circuit requires 100 qubits, 51 functional ones split into 50 control qubits and a single target qubit, and an additional 49 auxiliary qubits. This implementation uses many auxiliary qubits to reduce the CX gate count as much as possible, just like we saw previously. Now let's ask the synthesis engine to generate the same MCX gate, but now for the IBM 127 qubit Eagle processor, a superconducting architecture with limited connectivity between the qubits as shown in this image. The connectivity diagram is formed by vertically stacking lines of 14 or 15 qubits and connecting them via alternating four qubit layers. We select the quantum device and synthesize the circuit. It takes a bit longer due to the qubit routing involved in the circuit compilation process. The resulting circuit now uses 75 qubits only. Let's explain this result. As explained in the previous lesson, forming an entangling gate like CX between indirectly connected qubits requires routing the qubit state using swap gates. And each swap gate costs us three CX gates. Gate level compilers perform optimization passes to reduce this number of necessary swap gates. However, this example shows that a turning point still exists, resembling the classical case using too many auxiliaries results in routing overhead bigger than the gain obtained from temporarily storing the quantum computations. Note that this result doesn't mean that the best possible implementation of MCX for this specific hardware consists of 75 qubits. It tells us that this is the best possible implementation among the functions available in Classic's library. Still, this highlights the diminishing return behavior of adding too many auxiliaries. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. We got much deeper into the heart of what the Classic engine does and how it can be used when synthesizing with specific hardware needs in mind. See you in the next lecture. We have learned so far about different hardware modalities, how they may affect our functional model, and the hardware-aware synthesis feature. Whether it's classical or quantum, code is meant to be executed. Let's learn how to do it with the classic platform. We'll start with a very simple circuit, so we can analyze the results properly. Let's create a state preparation of two qubits for the probabilities 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.4. We can do that by choosing the state preparation queue mod and edit the probabilities. That's our circuit. Now we can click the execute button. Welcome to the execution screen. From here, we can control our execution preferences, perform multiple executions at once, and compare our circuit's performance on multiple hardware. But let's do it one step at a time. The left side of the screen allows us to choose the backends filter by the different providers and the backend type, whether it's a hardware or a simulator, in order to find your favorite machine. Most of the backends require credentials that you may get by opening accounts on the respective provider, such as IBM Quantum, Azure Quantum, Amazon Bracket, and IMQ. We will start by using the Air Simulator, which runs inside the classic platform, meaning you don't need any firmware credentials. The right side of the screen allows us to modify the execution preferences. For now, we will focus on two preferences, the number of shots, which we will keep, and the transpilation option. It allows us to transpile the circuit before execution to better fit to the backend with different levels of optimization. We will keep it at the decompose level as well. Now we are ready, let's run. 
we are redirected to the job screen that represents all the execution jobs we have submitted. We can see that the execution result is indeed what we anticipated, a rise in amplitude of the states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. This was a simple exercise, making sure we know what are our options. Let's see what else we can do with a bit more sophisticated example. Back to the synthesis table. Let's scroll all the way down to the Q mode called Learning Functional Level Design Arithmetics. Adjust the max width to 7 and synthesize. This circuit prepares a couple of registers in different bell states 00 plus 11 and 01 plus 10 and afterward adds them up. The interesting part of the circuit is the adder, since it behaves differently at different connected hardware. And we can even see that before executing the circuit. We are going to execute the circuit on three different backends from three different providers. Let's choose IBM Nairobi, Amazon Rocket SV1, and Azure IonQ QPU. By selecting all of them, we execute the circuit on them simultaneously. We can also press the Compare Hardware button, which transpiles the circuit to the hardware that we chose. It allows us to look at the differences between how different hardware will digest our circuit. In our case, we can notice how the trapped ion hardware of IonQ will result in a shallower circuit for us than the superconductor computer of IBM. You can even compare the backends by a very simple yet important feature, the waiting time, by clicking the arrow next to the backend name. For this example, I'm going to choose the IBM CASM simulator and IBM Nairobi. We are ready to execute, just as a new screen pops up, the credential screen. Since we chose backends that run on a cloud, or different clouds for that matter, we need access to use them. But don't be frightened, if you don't know how to get these credentials, click the Need Help button for each provider to receive more information. These credentials may also be saved on password managers for easy integration with the ID. Clicking Run will create two different jobs, one for each backend. Let's go back to the most basic question. What do we really execute? We execute a classical algorithm, a hybrid algorithm to be precise. Every quantum algorithm that you can think of is actually a classical algorithm. The simplest one being take this quantum circuit, sample it a thousand times, and return the resulting histogram. A bit more hybrid than that is Grover's algorithm, where we sample the circuit, verify classically the results, and maybe sample again, a different circuit this time. The list goes on and on, and so we need a way to describe what is going to be executed when we press the button. This all leads to the classical functions, being part of the model itself. Each model contains a classical main function that describes the algorithm. Its functionality will be expanded as we grow, and you will be able to describe more algorithms with it. Learn more about our classical functions in our documentation at docs.classic.io. I hope you enjoyed the hardware lessons and learned how to integrate the hardware into each step of the Classic platform. Thank you.